10 months after they were married, Ellen gave birth to a daughter, Margaret. Jesse and Nellie soon followed. Besides caring for her daughters, Ellen focused on Woodrow's career. From the start of their courtship, she had known of his dream of winning political office. But she also knew that it would be hard for a would-be politician to support a family. The couple agreed that Woodrow should become a professor instead. Wilson enrolled in graduate school at Johns Hopkins University. When his doctoral thesis was published, it received glowing reviews in newspapers across the country. America's federal government was dangerously weak, Wilson argued, and needed to be strengthened. He got fascinated with how do politics really work? That was his one subject uh, entirely throughout his life was how does power really work? And in turn, how can I wield it? Wilson wanted to wield power. When he was just 33, Wilson was offered a full professorship at his alma mater, Princeton. He became an enormously popular teacher. In seven out of eight years, he was voted favorite professor. We came into contact with a mind rich with knowledge, one student said. No one could touch him as a lecturer. At the end of his classes, Wilson was often given a standing ovation. Professor Wilson's lectures addressed the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots in America in the early 1890s. Captains of industry like the Rockefellers, Carnegies, and Morgans had become fabulously wealthy while the majority of American workers lived in poverty. Wilson was deeply influenced by a book of photographs by Jacob Rees titled, How the Other Half Lives. Rees's photographs had created a national sensation by exposing the squalor in which many Americans lived. There had been economic and social and political inequity in this country, certainly since the Civil War. The Depression of 1894, however, brought to the fore in glaring terms the level of inequity that existed. When you have a depression in which 20% of the American people are unemployed, thousands of businesses are going under, thousands of banks are going under, you have to begin to question whether this corporate elite is really running the show in the most equitable and wise fashion. Across the nation, rapidly growing populist and socialist movements were demanding real change. But the corporate elite refused to budge. Open warfare between strikers and union busters threatened to shut down factories and coal mines. Many feared that the nation was about to descend into chaos. Professor Wilson was one of the few who had a practical solution. Give America's government new power to rein in big business. He came to the conclusion that the government of the United States really did have to respond to these problems, that there was a kind of social compact between the people and the government, and working people were the people. He was a bit fearful also that if neither of the major parties responded more forthrightly, then you were asking for bigger trouble down the road. If you didn't let some steam out of the pot, it was going to blow up in your face. Wilson's articles in magazines like Harper's attracted nationwide attention 
and offers to speak to political clubs and civic organizations began to pour in. Modern industry has so distorted competition as to put it into the power of some to tyrannize over many and enable the rich and strong to combine against the poor and weak. He apparently had an extraordinary effect on audiences and his voice was powerful and very moving. And I think when he spoke, he put his whole heart and soul into it and enjoyed it very much. I think he was probably at his best when he spoke. Soon, a buzz began to spread about the eloquent Mr. Wilson. Before long, he was the most famous man at Princeton. Few were surprised when at 46, he was named president of the college. But Joseph Wilson believed that God had even greater plans for his son. This is only the beginning of a very great career, he told all who would listen. During his early years as president of Princeton, Wilson continued to receive invitations from around the nation to speak about political reform. He was time and again overwhelmed with applause, the Baltimore Sun wrote, and had to wait until the clapping ceased to be heard again. Harper's declared that Wilson was a man the nation would do well to pay attention to. By any measure, the Princeton president's star was on the rise. Then, on the morning of May 28, 1906, the Wilson household was thrown into panic. Woodrow awoke to discover that he had lost sight in one eye. Ellen rushed him to the hospital, where doctors discovered that the blood vessels behind Wilson's left eye had hemorrhaged. Back home, Nellie and her sisters waited anxiously for news of their father's condition. We were at the door waiting when they returned. Father was calm, but after one look at mother's face, we knew that something dreadful had happened. Not until he had gone upstairs did she tell us that the doctor's verdict was that he must give up all his work and live a retired life. Worst of all, there was no assurance that he would ever again regain his health completely. It is impossible to describe the panic and despair that engulfed us. The hemorrhage had been caused by a severe case of hypertension or high blood pressure. Here is a man who's 49 years old, relatively young, who already has a, an advanced disease. By the time we reach 1906, this disease process has already been ongoing for uh, a, at least a decade, simply because you don't get this type of finding unless the disease has been hanging around for a long time. The problem is it then begins to affect other organ systems if it's left untreated. You're talking about the heart, the kidneys, and most significantly, the brain. And the potential for that is catastrophic, ultimately. In 1906, the only known treatment for hypertension was rest. His doctor recommended that Wilson retire if he wished to live. Wilson decided to take a leave from Princeton and go to Britain to recuperate. He began a strict regime of exercise walking farther and farther each day until he was hiking up to 14 miles across the English countryside. With his sight returned and his health improved, he began to ponder his faith and his future. 
The Presbyterian faith meant a great deal to Wilson from the time he was first conscious of an idea through the rest of his life. He was a Calvinist in fact, and always a Calvinist, secure in the knowledge that he was one of the elect, uh, one of God's agents, he thought, on this earth. By the end of his stay in Britain, Wilson had become convinced that he had not yet fulfilled God's plan for him. He decided that he would devote himself to transforming Princeton, even if it meant risking his health. College should not be, as many think it is, a playground for the sons of very rich men. For they are not as apt to form definite and serious purposes as are those who know they must wet their wits for the struggle of life. With the rise of a new class of fabulously wealthy Americans, Princeton had become a place where the sons of the rich could gain a bit of culture without having to expend too much effort. A kind of country club. Now, Wilson wanted to change all that. He proposed building a world-class graduate school in the center of campus to train the next generation of American leaders. To help attract serious scholars, he planned to abolish Princeton's fraternity-like eating clubs, filled with the school's richest and laziest students. But Princeton's wealthy alumni were outraged by Wilson's attacks on their son's beloved clubs and threatened to withhold their donations. Rather than try to work out a compromise, Wilson declared war. Wilson had never found opposition easy to handle. He had this extraordinary uh, confidence that his was the right, that he was the special vehicle of the Lord, that he spoke the truth, so that opposition became almost, uh, in, in that definition, sacrilegious. After all, Calvinism was based upon a hatred of the gaudy riches and laziness of the Catholic Church. None of that for Woodrow Wilson at Princeton. Wilson's education was moral as much as it was intellectual. Over the next four years, Wilson spent a great deal of time fighting the alumni, but little time building the support he needed. Eventually, his graduate school was built, but far from the main campus. The upper crust eating clubs remained the center of university social life. Gradually, Wilson came to bitterly resent those who had opposed him. Certainly, this is the same place to a stick that I knew four years ago. But I have changed much more than it has. I am constantly confronted by specimens of the sort I like least. Restless, rich, empty-headed people. I am glad to see them disappear into the distance, but very resentful that I must have their dust in my nostrils. They and their kind are my worst enemies. Wilson became so frustrated that he began to think the time had come to leave Princeton and the job that had suited him so well. One morning in April of 1910, a well-known journalist arrived at Princeton. 
Ray Baker had taken on the role of scout for the progressive movement and was traveling the country in search of a new leader to fight for its agenda. Progressives were concerned that the focus on wealth and the focus on a top elite garnering all of the wealth had taken attention away from the purpose of the United States, which was supposed to be a democratic society in which the maximum number of people joined in making decisions. Baker had heard about Wilson's battles at Princeton. He wondered if the outspoken professor might be a potential progressive candidate for president in 1912. Baker spent two hours with Wilson, assessing his potential as a politician. I left Princeton convinced that I had met the finest mind to be found in American public life. And yet, I concluded that he was politically impossible. Was he not wholly without practical experience? He did not know the leaders of his own party in New Jersey or even in his own town. I did not believe in miracles. Baker may have been unwilling to bet on Wilson, but not the New Jersey Democratic boss, Sugar Jim Smith. Smith was a charming Irishman who was rumored to have taken more than his share of bribes. He was desperate to find someone who could win the New Jersey governorship by appealing to progressive voters, but who was politically naive enough to be easily manipulated. Boss Smith offered Professor Wilson the Democratic nomination for governor. Wilson immediately accepted. But Ellen was less enthusiastic. After seeing a New York production of Macbeth, she worried about the physical cost to her husband of unrestrained ambition. Maybe these husbands ought not to be encouraged to get the things to which their ambitions lead them. I don't mean when the object of their ambition is wrong, as in Macbeth's case, but even when it is right. It may wear out their strength and spirit and health, and yet they will never be happy unless they get it. In September of 1910, Woodrow Wilson began his campaign for governor. I endorse the splendid program of the progressives to put things forward by fairness, by justice, by a concern for all interests. The election went just as Sugar Jim Smith had planned. Wilson led the Democrats to a statewide sweep. Immediately after the new governor was sworn in, Sugar Jim came calling at the Capitol to give Wilson his marching orders. There's great irony in Wilson's entrance into politics, which is that he comes in as the tool of the bosses. And they, they want Wilson as a Trojan horse, really. Well, turns out their Trojan horse was a real horse. In defiance of Smith, Wilson introduced four major reform bills. An anti-corruption law, election reform, new laws to regulate corporations, and workmen's compensation. The whole country is watching the first session of the New Jersey legislature under Wilson with interest, the New York Times wrote. It is the beginning of the combat between him and the old system. Sugar Jim still controlled many of the votes in the legislature, and he was confident he would be able to teach the professor a lesson. But when Sugar Jim's supporters gathered at a legislative caucus to plan Wilson's defeat, they were stunned when the governor arrived in person to confront them. The legislators angrily told him that his presence was unconstitutional. In response, Wilson whipped a copy of the state constitution out of his pocket and cited the passage that gave him the right to be present. Then he made an appeal to what he called their better 
unselfish natures. Every one of the new governor's reform bills passed. Wilson was a great surprise as a politician. He had had no uh, elected public life before this moment. He was a, the darkest of dark horses. But he was a refreshing presence. He was someone who spoke clearly and emphatically and spoke truth to power and uh, denounced the bosses and denounced the bankers and the corporate titans and so on in language that was precise and eloquent to a degree that few others could do. Wilson had served in elected office for just two years, but newspapers across the country were suddenly calling him a contender for the White House. Why is Governor Woodrow Wilson now frequently mentioned as a Democratic candidate for the presidency? The Rocky Mountain News asked. We think the answer is to be found in two words, progressiveness and courage. The Democratic Convention of 1912 took place in Baltimore. The excited delegates were convinced that the White House was within their grasp, if only they could agree on a candidate. In three previous elections, the Democrats had backed Nebraska populist William Jennings Bryan. The Democratic progressives had run hard behind Bryan three different times. He lost all three times by increasing margins. And so they needed to find someone who could win. They needed somebody who would not scare uh, the richest, most powerful people in society who ran most of the newspapers in America, which was the mass media at the time. Uh, and they also wanted someone, of course, who was a true uh, progressive. Nine candidates had tossed their hats in the ring. The favorites were Wilson, backed by reformers in the North, and Champ Clark, darling of conservatives and big city bosses. Though William Jennings Bryan was not running, everyone knew that it would be impossible to win the nomination without his support. For years, Bryan and Wilson had held each other in mutual contempt. But then Ellen Wilson stepped in. Though she was ambivalent about Woodrow's political ambitions, Ellen was also fiercely loyal. Without consulting her husband, Ellen invited Brian to dinner. That evening, Wilson, the Princeton intellectual, and Brian, the Nebraska populist, found out they had a surprising amount in common. I think any wife who, who feels that she understands so well her husband's career that she can uh, arrange dinner guests that fit those plans, I think that shows an enormous strength and independence. And arranging a dinner with anybody as important as a, a former candidate for president and then telling your husband to get home because you had arranged it, it shows a lot of guts. Ellen made it possible for Wilson to be Wilson. She was very shrewd about how to exploit opportunities. Whenever he had a great career change, whenever he had a great turning point, uh, Ellen's advice was absolutely critical. On June 27th, the delegates began voting in the sweltering heat of Baltimore's convention hall. Round after round of balloting produced deadlock after deadlock. The convention of 1912 in Baltimore was one of the more exciting political conventions in American history, probably in world history, for that matter. It was very hot, of course. It was July. It was Baltimore before the days of air conditioning. So this didn't help matters. You were involved in a circus which at any moment could break out into a fist fight. With no end to the deadlock in sight, Woodrow Wilson headed for the place he loved best. While he was on the 18th tee, he got word that the log jam at the convention had started to break. William Jennings Bryan was throwing his support behind Governor Wilson. On 
On the 46th ballot, Wilson became the Democratic nominee for president. For all its drama, the convention was only the opening act for one of the most exciting presidential elections America had ever seen. To use a phrase of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the American voters, especially middle-class voters, were in 1912 in an heroic mood. They were in heroic mood demanding change. It's one of the most significant elections in all of American history because it's a, it involves a philosophical debate about the nature of government uh, of a depth and a sophistication that we've rarely seen in American politics. On the right was the Republican candidate, President William Howard Taft, running for a second term with strong support from big business. On the left was socialist Eugene Debs, who told his millions of supporters that it was time for the working class to run America. Two candidates were trying to win the voters in the middle. One was Wilson. The other was former President Theodore Roosevelt, running as leader of his new Bull Moose Party. Both Roosevelt and Wilson were reformers. It was the only thing they had in common. Where Roosevelt was blustering and charismatic, Wilson often seemed cold and distant. Where Roosevelt was a baby kisser and backslapper, a reporter had once said that shaking Wilson's hand was like shaking a dead fish. Wilson was painfully aware of their differences. He appeals to their imagination. I do not. He is a real, vivid person who they have seen and shouted themselves hoarse for and voted for millions strong. I am a vague, conjectural personality, more made up of opinions and academic prepossessions than of human traits and red corpuscles. I think they were two very different personalities. Uh, Roosevelt had a reputation of being one of the most kinetic, if not frantic, political personalities of his era. Wilson was much more cerebral, uh, much more careful and precise. But beneath that scholarly demeanor of his, there was a quite a passionate individual, passionate about politics, and often passionate about his own personal life. As election day neared, the Roosevelt camp came into possession of one of Mary Peck's steamy love letters to Wilson which was apparently stolen from Wilson's luggage. Roosevelt's advisors urged him to release the letter to the press. But Roosevelt refused. It was hopeless, he said, to convince the public that a man who looked like a drugstore clerk was, in reality, a Romeo. They didn't release the letters, and I think that's why most people have trouble seeing Woodrow Wilson as this passionate man, because he did look like the druggist on the corner, you know? He was very academic, those steel-rimmed glasses, he always seemed very serious, but he was an extremely passionate person. Wilson's best hope against Roosevelt was to speak to Americans in person. He crisscrossed the nation, warning his audiences that big business was cutting average Americans out of their fair share of the nation's wealth. We must choose whether we shall continue to have our affairs dominated and determined by small groups of men, or whether we shall again assert the individual independence of the American people in the conduct of their business and their politics. Wilson promised Americans a new freedom, a new opportunity for the average person to get ahead in the world. The difference between Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson at that time 
was that Woodrow Wilson wanted to enact a very tough antitrust law to break up the big corporations into smaller units, then the government could sit back and have a kind of self-regulating economy so that smaller business people, the man on the make, he used that phrase a lot, could have an opportunity to realize their full potential. This would be, this is part of what he meant by the new freedom. Wilson spent election day at the governor's home in New Jersey. After dinner, he read Ellen and his daughters a poem by Browning about the importance of accepting God's will. Indeed, the special marking of the man is prone submission to the heavenly will, seeing it, what it is, and why it is. Nellie was the first to hear the sound that signaled the outcome of the election. I heard the first muffled tone of the bell of old Nassau Hall. Another moment, it was ringing like a thing possessed. I ran to one of the front windows. In all directions, there were people coming. Swarms had already invaded the little garden and were crowding around the porch. Swaying torches made grotesque circles of light. And there, a red glare shining full on his face was Father. Utterly, utterly unfamiliar. He was no longer my father. These people, strangers who had chosen him to be their leader, now claimed him. He belonged to them. On March 3rd, 1913, the Wilsons arrived in Washington to celebrate Woodrow's inauguration as president. But the family had as much to worry about as celebrate. Wilson had won just 43% of the vote, hardly a mandate. Before the election, he had forecast that the life of the next president would be hell, and said that the stress of the job might well kill him. Ellen was also worried about what the strain of the presidency would do to Woodrow's blood pressure. But as Nellie helped her mother prepare for an inaugural tea at the White House, the first sign came that it was Ellen who was in trouble. I arranged her hair and adjusted her prettiest hat at just the right angle. She hardly said a word. Then, suddenly, putting both hands over her face, she burst into tears. There was almost despair in her sudden break. Something I had never seen before. I was afraid that Mother was ill. As she left with Father, I cried with black despair. It will kill them. It will kill them both. On March 4th, 1913, Wilson was inaugurated the 28th President of the United States. Soon after he took office, Wilson announced that he would do something no president in 113 years had done, address the Congress in person. Then he sat down at his typewriter 
a machine which he had been one of the first Americans to embrace, and began tapping out his speech. I am very glad indeed to have this opportunity to address the two houses directly, and to verify for myself the impression that the President of the United States is a person, not a mere department of the government hailing Congress from some isolated island of jealous power, sending messages, not speaking naturally and with his own voice, that he is a human being trying to cooperate with other human beings in a common service. As he settled into his new job, Wilson established a strict schedule. He arrived at eight each day for a breakfast of coffee, oatmeal, and two raw eggs in fruit juice, like swallowing a newborn baby, he said. He then dictated from 9 to 10 a.m. and saw visitors until 1. After lunch with his family, he returned to his office. Nearly all who came to see him there were struck by the president's deep sense of mission. When the chairman of the Democratic Party came to demand a job in return for helping Wilson win the presidency, Wilson told him that it was not the Democratic Party, but God who had made him president. A character in any president is in an important part of the way he handles his office. Now, in Wilson's case, let's just take one aspect of his character, his certitude, his certitude that he was right. Now, certitude is a great asset uh, when you have to uh, fight for what you believe in uh, and when you convince other people that you're correct. But certitude is a serious obstacle when you're trying to achieve something to which there's a good deal of opposition and where it's necessary to compromise in order to have your way. Wilson was fortunate that in his early days in office, there was little organized opposition to his plans for change. In a rapid-fire series of bills, he was able to toughen antitrust laws, win new protections for labor unions, create the Federal Reserve System to make loans more easily available to average Americans, and give government the resources it needed to rein in big business by creating the first lasting income tax. The first two years of uh, Wilson's first term are one of the most remarkable moments in modern American politics. There's more uh, reform agenda accomplished in that brief moment than in virtually any other two-year period in the 20th century. He lays down the rhetorical markers about how the state must step forward to insulate uh, citizens against the volatilities of the free market. And this has defined the character of American politics uh, ever since. In a second round of reforms, Wilson pushed through the first law mandating an eight-hour workday and the first law banning child labor. There's a very nice coincidence for Wilson. In many ways, the kind of ideas that the progressives and programs that they had begun to agitate for are exactly the kind of things that he had been studying for over 20 years. Now, how do you make government more accountable? You know, how do you make it more open? How do you exercise power both more efficiently and more openly and, and more answerably there? And it's uh, the man in the moment found each other beautifully in that. It was an impressive record, but not an unblemished one. Many prominent African Americans had supported Wilson in 1912 because of his promise that his new freedoms would apply to all Americans equally. But once he was in office, Wilson sided with the many Southern Democrats in Congress and in his cabinet who favored segregation. During his first term, the House passed a law making racial intermarriage a felony in the District of Columbia. Then, Wilson's new Postmaster General overturned 50 years of integration by ordering that his Washington offices be segregated. Soon, plans were made to segregate many other federal departments. 
to understand Woodrow Wilson's racial views, it is important to remember that he was a Southerner. He had been raised in a climate in which it was presumed that African-American people were less evolved than Anglo-Saxon people. This was not a casual assumption on his part. It was one that was ingrained in his whole being. In 1914, newspaper publisher William Monroe Trotter led a delegation of African-Americans who had endorsed Wilson to the White House. Trotter angrily asked the president, have you a new freedom for white Americans and a new slavery for your Afro-American fellow citizens? They demand an accounting from uh, Woodrow Wilson. Uh, they supported the man, and this is the, these are the consequences. And Wilson pleads misunderstanding and suggests that what is being done is really a boon and a benefit to the African Americans. It's uh, it's taking away the tension in in the workplace, as it were. Uh, well, Trotter will have none of this, and voices rise and tempers rise until Wilson uh, excuses Trotter from his presence. As Trotter leaves, he does something quite extraordinary. He convenes his own press conference on the grounds of the White House and reenacts the exchange uh, just transpired between him and, uh, and the president. Wilson was furious that a black man would dare to publicly question him. For the rest of his presidency, he would make no effort to improve race relations in America. In every man's life, there's the possibility of making a considerable difference by attitude, by a word spoken, by something done or not done. You'd have to say that in the area of race relations, Woodrow Wilson was deficient on all those points. He neither said what should have been said, he neither did what should have been done, uh, nor did he understand uh, what needed doing. It would be an irony of fate if my administration had to deal chiefly with foreign affairs. All of my preparation has been in domestic affairs. In Wilson's first month in office, Mexico erupted in revolution when its democratically elected president was murdered by the Mexican military. Wilson was convinced that the right thing for the United States to do was send in troops to restore democracy to Mexico. Always the idealist, uh, always the moralist, uh, Wilson did have some general ideas about foreign relations to which he repaired uh, when the crises in Mexico arose. As always, uh, he saw the United States as a special vehicle of the Lord to uh, provide an example to the world of the blessings of democracy and constitutionalism. Wilson hadn't thought that much about foreign policy. Like nearly all Americans of his time, even the best educated ones, he thought about domestic affairs. It just, this just wasn't, this was not something that was on his mind that much. And he had to learn it. We have a president of the United States who has to learn foreign policy by the seat of his pants. When the American Navy sailed into Veracruz, Mexicans saw it as Yankee imperialism and united to fight the invaders. The resulting battle left more than a hundred dead. Despite the fierce Mexican opposition, Wilson remained certain that his was the right course. When rebels attacked a border town, Wilson sent more troops into Mexico, once again embroiling the United States in the chaotic revolution. Wilson's actions sparked intense criticism. What legal or moral right has a president of the United States to say who should be president of Mexico, Harper's Monthly asked. Wilson is a ridiculous creature in international matters, Theodore Roosevelt declared. He is the very worst man we have ever had in his position. Wilson's intervention in Mexico, in a sense, reveals the, the, his amateurism in this area. 
it's a marker, I think, of just how indifferent he was to the rest of the world, that he, he had the, a reflex uh, impulse to introduce military forces. That was a pretty ham-handed device for trying to deal with the complicated politics of the Mexican Revolution. Mexico was just the beginning of Wilson's entanglement in foreign affairs. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria was assassinated by a Serbian nationalist. Austria and Germany mobilized their armies to punish the Serbs. To defend them, Russia and France called up their armies. It was clear to all that the great powers of Europe were on the verge of a catastrophic war. Deeply influenced by his boyhood experience of the Civil War, Wilson believed that such a conflict offered nothing but heartache for all caught up in it. And yet, there were powerful forces pushing him to get involved. Woodrow Wilson has a problem on his hands. He's committed as an American president to defend the national interest of the United States, which interest is to stay out of that European war. At the same time, he has a multi-ethnic population in which there are millions of people whose families are fighting on both sides of a conflict. He therefore has an impossible political task, which is to keep the country out of war and at the same time respond to major pulls of public opinion to get involved on one side or another. For a president who knew little about foreign affairs, it was the greatest challenge imaginable. And yet, in July of 1914, the impending disaster in Europe was by no means the first thing on Woodrow Wilson's mind. 